Advent is a season of preparation and repentance. Preparation for the coming of Christ among us and repentance for our sin. And repentance is not a very well-loved word right now, but it has a very simple meaning. It means turning. Uh, We turn from sin and we turn to God. And in a nutshell, this is John the Baptist's message. Start where you are and turn toward God. That's what John is saying. And let me set the scene for you a little bit here when we talk about John the Baptist. Um, John the Baptist is the forerunner of Jesus. He prepares the way. And and Luke tells us about John's ministry. There's a lot of names that he lists. We're going to look at some of these. But there's a lot of names that that Luke lists here because he is a very careful historian. And at the beginning of the gospel, he told his audience that he's setting out to investigate everything from the first. He wants to get it all straight. And here's what we need to know. Luke tells us that this story takes place in the reign of Tiberius Caesar. So if you follow along here in the gospel, you'll see Tiberius Caesar as the first name that he mentions. And Tiberius was the adopted son of Caesar Augustus. And you remember Caesar Augustus from back in chapter 2 of the gospel of Luke. He was the one who called for the census um, during the time when Jesus was born. And Augustus dies, and Tiberius, his adopted son, takes over as the emperor of Rome. So think of Tiberius as the king, the president. He is the one in charge of the whole of the Roman Empire. Luke mentions some other names. Men who ruled after Herod the Great died in 4 BC. And Herod the Great is, um, he was a, uh, the, the individual who built the temple in Jerusalem. It had been destroyed earlier. He rebuilt it in even more grandeur, possibly, than what Solomon had built. But he wasn't called great because he was a fantastic guy. He was called great because he was very powerful. He consolidated power in that whole region of Judea in his own hands. And after he dies, um, there's this jostling for power. He was the one who tried to kill Jesus when he was a little baby. Um, He wants no other claimants to his throne. But after Herod the Great dies, there's this jostling for power. And his kingdom is divided up into four portions, and each of those portions has a ruler called a tetrarch, right? Like a ruler of a fourth, a tetrarch. Um, And Luke mentions, first off, that Pontius Pilate is the um, governor of Judea. Um, There he is. And Pontius Pilate, you know his name. He was the, the Roman who was sent to rule after Archelaus, who was one of Herod's sons, turned out to be this brutal, terrible ruler. And so the Romans said, we need somebody else in there. They sent Pilate. Pilate's not that much better, but he lasts a little bit longer. Then there is Herod, who is the Tetrarch of Galilee. He's also known as Herod Antipas. If you look at verse 19 and 20, you find out that he's not a good guy, because in verse 19 and 20, we see what he does. He um, had married his brother's wife, and then he had locked up John the Baptist when John the Baptist had criticized him. And later we know that in this this moment of of celebration, this kind of terrible birthday party, we know that Herod Antipas brings the head of John the Baptist to his um, the wife's daughter on a platter. Um, So he's not a good guy. He he marries uh, he marries the uh, um, his niece whose name is Herodias, and Herodias had previously been married to her other uncle named Philip. And there was this breakup and this remarriage, and it caused this scandal, which gets John the Baptist to take him to task for that and criticize him. But you can kind of see it's this close-knit family, right, where the niece is married at different points to both of her uncles. Um, and they're both, the, one of the uncle's names, Herod, the, the, the grandfather is Herod, the niece is Herodias. You can kind of see who they're all looking up to, right? Um, the family tree's a little tangled. And then there's Licinius. Um, Luke calls him the Tetrarch of Abilene, and Lysanias may or may not have been a son of Herod the Great, but when Archelaus' kingdom was removed from him, given to Pontius Pilate, Lysanias got Abilene. Okay, I'm going somewhere with this. 
Luke also lists Annas and Caiaphas. They're the high priests, right? So we had the political power. Then we've got the religious power. Annas was an older man, the, the true high priest. And then the Romans had come in and removed him and later placed his son-in-law Caiaphas in his place as high priest. But Luke regards Annas as the true high priest. And, and, we, and I think in this time, Annas was really the one who's pulling the strings behind the scenes. Because, you know, think about it, the Gospel of John at the very end in um, chapter 18. Jesus is arrested and he's taken by night. And who is he taken to see? It's Annas. So Annas is the, the one who is recognized as the true religious authority. He wants to get a crack at Jesus at the end of his ministry before anyone else does. And then look at this. Follow me on this. Verse 2, we've got all of these different um, names that are listed. Look at the middle of verse 2. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the desert. John the Baptist it just slices through all of this political and religious power. The word of God comes to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. It cuts through all of this political tension, this religious tension, these bad and oppressive leaders, these bad and oppressive religious leaders. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. There it is. The word of God comes on the scene. It's this simple declaration that karate chops the reign of the powers that be. And notice this. Where was John when he hears the word of God? Check this out. Where was he? He's in the desert. I mean, so notice that John was already out in the desert when he hears the word of God. He was already seeking God. He had already placed himself in a position that he could hear from God. He wasn't just waiting around for lightning to strike or something like that. God was saying, all right, God's, John, John was saying, all right, God, I'm, I'm wait, waiting. I'm ready. I want to hear from you. He put himself out in the desert. And we know he spent some time out there. This wasn't like a one-day hike with a backpack and a bottle of water. John was in the desert for quite some time because he learned to live off the land. Remember what he ate? The, the locusts and the wild honey. Remember what he wore? These wild clothes that he had kind of fashioned for himself, the kind of animal skins. And, and, and he shows up as this, this, this unkempt prophet who speaks the word of God. And you know, it takes a stubbornness kind of like John had to, to keep listening. Keep waiting, keep trusting that God will speak to us when he is ready and when we are. It takes some stubbornness to realize that, that God is not going to be drowned out by all of what's going on in the world, whatever's happening in the, the sphere of political power, however bad that might be, whatever's happening in, in the sphere of religious power in John's day, that is not going to drown out the word of God, the voice of God. The word of God comes to John in the desert. In verse 3, John is in the desert, um, and then we see him. He goes into the countryside along the Jordan, and he starts preaching the word of God to the people that he finds there. And Luke tells us that it is a, a word about baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, now, baptism is deeply connected to the rites of purification from the Old Testament law. So Le or Leviticus 16, before the priest can minister in the tabernacle, you know that, that holy tent, before the priest can minister in the tabernacle, he has to wash himself. It's this way of cleansing himself ceremonially of sin. It's asking for a clear conscience from God in order to be able to serve God. It's this precursor to baptism. And Jesus, of course, also teaches his followers to baptize, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 19. Go out and baptize. John here is preparing the way. And the word repentance, um, repentance is the word that I mentioned before that means turning. And so those who receive baptism are those who want to turn their life around, those who want to live a different way. And getting baptized is a way that they symbolize that. It's this combination of an inner desire to be purified by God and this outward sign of baptism. It's an act of faith. And we're going to look at more of what this baptism of repentance means here in just a minute. But Luke tells us that John is the one preparing the way. 
John is the one who is doing what Isaiah had promised. He's the voice of one calling out in the desert. John is getting the people ready to be able to receive and understand Jesus. And he's a prophet as of old. I mean, just look at his message. Look at verse 7. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, look at his words, you brood of vipers. It's a little tough. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? I mean, John, John just gets out there and he says it like it is. He recognizes people's sin. He does not, as we say in Spanish, have any hairs on his tongue. He just says it. Um, you brood of vipers. And then verse 8, produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children from, for Abraham. So verse 8, that's the key verse for us. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance or worthy of repentance. And we're going to come back to that. But notice what the response is or the implied response. It seems like a lot of people were saying, well, you know, we've got Abraham as our father. And what they mean is that Abraham is our ancestor literally and in the faith. Because for, for, the Jew, for Jewish people, their claim to fame goes back to the fact that Abraham was their forefather. That Abraham was the one that God had chosen from among the nations to be the seed of his chosen people. That Abraham was the one who belonged to God, and to belong to Abraham means that we also are part of the people of God. That being a child of God didn't have anything to do with what they had done, or with their faith, or with their disposition to God. It was about being a child of Abraham. And John just gets in there and upsets the apple cart. I mean, he tells them that what, what's going to matter is not where they come from, but where they're going. He tells them that it doesn't matter who their earthly ancestor is. What matters is who their father in heaven is. He tells them that what matters to God is not their DNA, but their hearts. So are they right with God? Are they loving God? Are they seeking forgiveness for their sins? Are they trying to turn their lives around? In short, have they repented? Are they producing the fruit of repentance? And re repentance means turning from sin to God. All right, and so repentance also, though, implies something very straightforward. It's a simple truth. Repentance means we have not arrived. And you know, some of the people must have thought that they had already arrived. Because they thought that because they were children of Abraham, there was nothing more to say. I mean, they were chosen people. Look, John, what part of chosen don't you understand? But John would not let them off the hook. The journey is not over. They still have a ways to go toward God. It doesn't matter if they're Abraham's children because God can make children out of rocks if he wants to. And neither, notice this, neither does John allow himself the luxury of complaint. He's a prophet, not an internet blogger. He doesn't just complain how bad people are, about how dumb the leaders have been, about how everybody's failed. He points them toward God. He points them toward transformation. He says that it doesn't matter what has happened, that is water down the Jordan, turn towards God, point your life toward him. We have not arrived. Start where you are and turn toward God. Because what, listen to this, what, what God wants from us is a transformed life. God wants to see us growing so that our lives reflect the image of Christ. God wants to see us laying aside everything that keeps us from him, everything that warps our lives, everything that holds us back from being conformed to his goodness, his holiness. And the word for all of that is an old-fashioned one. It's sin. And John's words are a wake-up call into people who are wrapped up in sin. Look at verse 10. The people come and they say, what should we do then? What should we do then? So the people are, they, they hear John. And the people are saying, okay, fine. We, we hear your prophetic word. We hear that something is wrong in our heart. We're convicted. We hear that we need to repent and change our lives. But how? How? I mean, are we supposed to come out into the desert and eat locusts and honey with you? And look at John's answer. Verse 11. 
The man with two tunics should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. In other words, John is saying, start where you are. Start with what you have. Make a change at the place that you're at right now. And look, he tells something to the tax collectors really similar. Verse 12, tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? And then verse 13, don't collect any more than you are required to. Now listen, tax collectors are not just the IRS guy. They don't just send you nasty letters if you make a mistake on your, one of your line items. I mean, they've got soldiers in this time. They shake you down when you go by their stand at the city gates. They, some of them run criti- uh, criminal enterprises on the side, like prostitution rings. And people saw tax collectors as complete and utter traitors because they were collaborating with the Roman authorities to help oppress their own Jewish brothers and sisters, families and friends and neighborhoods. And John, look at this, John doesn't even tell them to give it up. He tells them to do their work justly. Don't collect any more than you're required to, which, you know, that may very well be a backhanded way of telling them to quit, because if you can't collect more than you're required to, what's the point? How are they supposed to make a living? But then look what happens next. Verse 14, some soldiers asked him, And what should we do? And he replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. So he doesn't tell them to stop being soldiers. Instead, he says, don't extort money. And the word that he uses here is a very special word. It's used only one other time in the scriptures. It's in the Apocrypha in 3rd Maccabees. And it means to take money or property by force. And in that day, that is pretty much what soldiers did. Kings called up their soldiers, they invaded another territory, and they took people's possessions by force. And so John is questioning the very basic duties that soldiers have in his day. In today's terms, it'd be sort of like saying, well, you can continue to be a soldier, just don't shoot anyone. He's telling them that they're going to have to start where they're at And then they're going to have to work out, have to find a way to live their life before God. And I love this. I I love the way that John the Baptist points people towards God. I mean, he recognizes that life is complex. That there are going to be hard decisions for how any of us live out our commitments toward God. John just says, start where you're at. Start where you are. And of course... Where else would we start, right? I mean, sometimes we want to start where other people are. Hey, I mean, let me tell you what's wrong with your life. But John says, start where you are. Make changes in your life. No one has ever experienced transformation in their life by starting where someone else is. That's a fact. And I know that there are all sorts of reasons that we can feel like we can't do what John calls us to, that we're stuck, that we don't know what to do, or we don't even know if we believe that we can change. There are barriers. And here's the thing. We can't grade our own homework. I mean, we almost always grade ourselves on the curve. It's Not even that we always judge ourselves better. Sometimes that's the case when we're critical and judgmental towards other people, but we see only our own best intentions. But you know, sometimes we grade ourselves too harshly too. Sometimes we beat ourselves up for things that we've done and said, and we can't even believe that God would ever have mercy on us. And we need the word of God to come and just cut through the false stories that we tell about ourselves this is why that first letter to the apostle, by the Apostle John reads, We assure our hearts before God whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. We're all equally unworthy, equally sinners, yet God loves us profoundly and holds all of us as equally worthy of his grace. And when people came, John's message to them was, there's grace for you. That's the, that's the long and the short of it. He's saying, start where you are and seek God. That means there is grace for you. It is possible for you to seek God, for you to turn. 
That's why he preaches to them. When the tax collectors come, John's message was, there's grace for you. It is possible. When the soldiers came and asked John, what should we do? He said, there's grace for you. I mean, that's even John's message to Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas, the guy who ends up cutting off John's head. He rebukes him like everyone else, like we saw in verse 19. And he gets thrown into prison and killed. And that's the thing. There is grace for all of us. We're all worthy of God's grace. None of us is ever at a place where God can't reach us. We just start where we are and we turn towards God. And you see this all over the place in Jesus' teaching. John the Baptist is the forerunner. He's always pointing towards Jesus, always pointing toward Jesus' teaching. This is verse 16. I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come. That's Jesus. The thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He says, I'm below him. And John, the, the gospel of John, he says, I'm going to decrease. He's going to increase. He says, I am baptizing you with water. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John's preparing the way for Jesus, and his teaching fits with what Jesus teaches, especially on repentance. This is why in the gospel of Mark, the very first words out of Jesus' mouth in the Gospel of Mark are, the time has come, repent and believe the good news. It's this call to turn from sin, turn towards him. This is why Jesus says on the lake shore and at the tax booth and in the marketplace and on the mountainside, follow me. He says, follow me because he expects that we will leave something behind, that we will leave old ways, shake off bad habits and follow him into a different way of life. Jesus says, follow me, because like his cousin, John the Baptist, he believes in transformation. And you know, the only way that anyone can really believe in transformation is if they have a sense that there is more to life than just what we see in front of us. I mean, this belief that God transforms lives is really something that I think a lot of, that, that sets us apart from people out in the world. It's something unique to Christians. I mean, the hope of transformation is what leads Christians to fight against slavery and start downtown missions and to keep on keeping on when everything looks grim. It's the hope of transformation that gives us the strength to pray for friends and family members and neighbors who are completely disinterested in Jesus. And you see this transformation wherever Jesus is. Just look at the Acts of the Apostles. Think of Simon the Magician in Acts chapter 8, who when he sees what Jesus does in the lives of his followers, he says, I want that. And he wants it so bad that he says, I will pay money if you give me the power to lay hands on people and Give them the Holy Spirit. Think of when Paul and Silas are in jail in Philippi in Acts chapter 16, and that jailer, after an earthquake, sees how their lives are so different, sees that they don't run away at the expense of him losing his life and livelihood. And he says, I want that. I want to be transformed. Think of Peter's conversion in chapter 10 of Acts of the Apostles, where he sees that even people who had been previously considered unworthy can in fact become the people of God. And you know, I'm not just talking about that grand, dramatic transformation of coming to Christ, of committing your life to following him, but I'm talking about coming to Christ each day a little bit more, turning to God a little bit more. And I mean, if you haven't come to Christ, if you don't know him, if you haven't come to God seeking forgiveness and seeking the strength to follow him, then yeah, now would be a great time for that. Jesus is saying, just come to me. Just come, repent and believe. But all of us, no matter where we're at, are called to deepen our faith in him, called to journey with him and towards God. Where's a place in your life where you need to turn towards God? I mean, do you need to turn towards God in the way that you treat your coworkers? Do you need to turn towards God in the way that you Think about your spouse. Do you need to turn toward God and some secret sin that's holding you back? Start where you are and turn towards God. Just come. Just take a step. And you may be thinking, that's fine and good. But I can't change. I can't get there from where I'm at. 
You may be thinking that your sins are beyond the pale, that you are unworthy. But listen to this. The reality is that all of us are equally broken. There is no special category of people out there who are the broken ones and then a bunch of other people who have got it together. I don't, I don't really know anyone who's got it all together. In fact, like Pastor John Ortberg once put it, everybody's normal until you get to know them. You see, all of us need Christ's transforming power in our lives, and all of us are equally capable of receiving it. But you know, a lot of us think that we can't change, and it's funny because in the American cultural script, we're told two contradictory things. We're told, on the one hand, that we are to become ourselves, to follow our hearts and obey our thirsts, and that there's this real us somewhere deep down inside that we've just got to discover and put on and become. But at the same time, we're led to believe that we can always have a fresh start, always start over, always begin again and redefine ourselves and become someone new. But I believe we can change. And I think a little bit about how things that seem so solid, so impervious to change, how in fact, even those things change. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard of the old man of the mountain in New Hampshire. They like it so much in New Hampshire that they put it on their license plates. And if you've ever had a New Hampshire state quarter in your pocket, you have seen it. It's been there for thousands of years. It had been there for thousands of years. And it'd be easy to look at the old man of the mountain. You know, it's got that kind of craggy face and think that'll never change. You know, it's a mountain. But in 2003 after water had been seeping down into the cracks of the rock for season upon season with freezing and thawing, the whole face suddenly slid away. And they knew something was going to happen. They had placed chains over the rock to try to hold it up. But once that change came, look out, it was an avalanche. There was no way to stop it. You know, God is at work in the hardened place of our places of our lives that seem impervious to change. God is slowly working behind the scenes, beneath those rocky surfaces. His grace is slowly trickling down. God loves all of us too much to leave us as we are. Change starts slowly, but as Pastor Rick Warren has put it, you will not experience transformation until you are dissatisfied with your current reality. It's when we start to recognize that something's not right, that we desire a different sort of life, that God's power really starts to penetrate and get unleashed in our souls. And this is good news. Repentance and transformation are the good news. Look at verse 18. With many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. You know, most of the time, we don't like people pointing out our weaknesses. And we can all too easily think that when that junk in our heart gets stirred up, it's because somebody's mean and judgmental. But not for Luke. When Luke talks about John the Baptist fierce preaching his words to that brood of vipers, his, the ones who are going to face wrath, the, one about whom he, the ones about whom he says, the axe is already lying at the foot of the trees, when Luke hears all of that, he says, that's good news. That is why people didn't run away from John. That's why people came and talked to him and said, what should we do? Because they heard it as good news. They sensed that he's preaching the good news of repentance and transformation. And they said, I want that. I want to get baptized. I want to be transformed. This is why in verse 18, we read that John exhorted the people and preached the good news to him, to them. John's message of repentance is good news because it's a message about the possibility of transformation, which is ultimately a message of hope. John said, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. It's not a message of damnation or condemnation or judgmentalism. It's a message of life. It's good news. And this is important because God in everything is always calling us to turn toward him and live. 
Amen.